Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. Exhort means to call up to a higher walk, preach at each other. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 26, it's speaking to the same people, all right? Let us do this, let us do that. He's in the plurals. He's not changing the subject. This is not a paragraph like some preachers treat it that's alienated from itself, that's talking to people that aren't in the room. This is to us. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Some translations handle it like this. If we continue sinning willfully, where continue is applied, there's no longer a sacrifice. This is the importance of the previous verses. You see the word for? You got to find out what it's there for, right? Exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So if we continue living in sin, there's no provision made for that. Now I believe in the security of the believer. I believe that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor things in the past can separate me from the Lord. But I also believe heaven is a place where there's not going to be liars, thieves, and fornicators. People who intentionally live in sin. How do you reconcile the two? It's a paradox. North and south, polar opposites, yet they're part of the world, right? Electricity, negative and positive, polar opposites, but yet it's true. Sin can never enter heaven. Jesus has done away not just with the penalty of sin, but with the power. So this is why we need each other, to help one another walk the straight walk. So if you see me getting off the path, you come to me and say, hey, help me understand why you're getting offended all the time. Or why you're defending holding a grudge. Or why you're not reaching out for help with this area of your life. I know this goes against pretty much every popular preacher out there. But it's the truth. Read the context. In my research, I saw one preacher disagree with it and then And then shun the responsibility of being their pastor saying, well, y'all read it and y'all make up your mind. It's here, guys. Let us consider one another. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. For if we sin willfully after we have received a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, those people that love to use this to preach that you can lose your salvation, they believe that you can get it back. I was raised in a denomination like that. You know, you're on a thread hanging over hell. God just daring you to make a mistake. And you could lose your salvation, but you could get it back. Well, you can't use this verse for that either. Because according to this, if you can lose it, there ain't no getting it back. So as people of God, we do not want to lose our salvation I don't think we can lose it, but we can throw it away. We can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We're seeing people deconstructing their faith. Pastors, they're calling it deconstructing their faith, totally renouncing the gospel. What's happening? They've not been assembling together with other believers. They've not been holding fast the confession of their faith and their hope. So let's read the paragraph. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment 
and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, talking about the Old Covenant, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he or she be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? I've been communicating with a guy that is doing this very thing. The blood of Jesus to him is meaningless. The cross was sins committed against Jesus. God allowed it to happen so he could convince the Jews with the miracle of the resurrection. That's all there is to it. And if, it's, if the gospel is true, as the Bible says it, then God is a child abuser. And he's not, he's not doing what he tells us to do, to forgive without a sacrifice. Surely he can forgive and he doesn't need Jesus to be the sacrifice. He's totally thrown out the redemption story, the plan that God put in place to break the hearts of man, to generate in us a desire to serve him. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he would have sanctified a common thing and insulted the spear of grace? How could a man go that far? He's not been assembling with other believers who will remind him of the truth. People are coming up with all kinds of off-the-wall stuff and calling it the new revelation, the new gospel. There's no new revelation. There's fresh insights to the revelation of the second covenant, the new covenant. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will you be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said... See, he's still the same we. Talking to us, the same people that he's been talking to through the book. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Those that twist this scripture to destruction say it's not written to us, this is for other people. Oh, really? Well, then how can you know what to claim in this book as being to you? It's written to the we, to the us, warning us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, lest we sin intentionally, lest we live a lifestyle of rebellion against the word and will of God and blaspheme the gospel. So these are people that have been persecuted by the Roman Empire, persecuted by fellow Jews who, do not under, who did not understand the new covenant, and persecuted no doubt by kinfolks wanting to disown them. And yet God had brought them through. So in an effort to encourage them to not forsake the assembling of themselves together, he reminds them of the former days of the things that God brought them through. Has God brought you thus far? When you face a challenge, do you think it's the end of the world or do you remind yourself, like David did, of the lion and of the bear? David went beyond that. He took Goliath's sword, cut his head off, and took his head for a walk. If Goliath had a ponytail, he maybe had it wrapped around his hand. But he took that head to Jerusalem which would one day become a city of Israel upon David conquering it. So what did he do? I don't know if he knew it then, but I'll tell you what he did. He reminded himself of the victories in the past. He reminded himself of the victories in the present. And he reminded himself by looking at the victories that were going to come in the future. Let's go future hunting, folks. Let's not fade into the sunset saying, oh, it didn't work. No, it worked back then. Faith worked back then. Hope worked back then. And it's working now. Let's hold it fast and rejoice when we're disappointed. Because God is a good God. The story's not over. And he's one to be feared, though. 